right. So looking at these opening hands, we see Simon has a pretty strong draw. I mean, you have to remember the Storm deck actually did get a new piece with the unbanning. They had, they now have four copies of Preordain in their deck, meaning they're going to be pretty prepared to set up for a combo much faster than they were before. We didn't really have access to a cantrip on Preordain's power level prior to this. So really looking forward to seeing what Simon's hand can do. Um, on the Tron side, there's not a ton going on with these first two hands. We see him having to take a Morgan to six, now Morgan down to five. But the good thing about Tron is you don't really need that many resources to function. Like if you have a good four card hand, it can be just as good if you get to set up and play a payoff by turn three or four. Yeah, and it looks like Corey is going down to five, four or five cards, something like that, but does have two Tron pieces, a Warping Whale and a Karn the Great Creator, which at least makes it look like he could get off the ground from here. Right. And one thing that Corey's hand does pretty well is if you draw that third Tron piece, you have your best payoff on turn three. You get to play Karn and hopefully get some sort of lock piece in order to stop Simon from comboing. And on the other side, his hand, pile of cantrips, couple rituals, remand, baral, really the usual suspects of what this deck is coming to expect. But you did call it that copy of Preordain, which he just top decked. Got to be happy to be getting that one early. Yeah, and I also see that Simon has access to Gigantha. I wonder if we'll see that come up. Although, in a matchup like this, where speed is key, I'm not sure if we'll be seeing Gigantha today. <laughs> yeah, really hard to imagine that one coming up too much. But I guess it does pressure Planeswalkers? Yeah, I mean, it certainly can. But, I mean, the other on the other hand, Simon's already found Gifts Ungiven, and he has Baral to set up, which yeah. means... He's kind of going already. Like, this could be a hand that goes off as early as turn three. Yeah, this is a spot where it looks like Simon is really only missing another ritual and a land drop to have the deterministic turn three kill. And that's Baral, two three mana rituals, a mana morphos, and a gifts ungiven lets you grape shot your opponent out. Yeah, yeah. And, and Corey missing on that third Tron piece on this turn. He had one key draw step to hit it. That's going to be good news for Simon, who's looking good to set up. Yeah, and considers really one of the undersung cantrips of modern that matters so much over something like sleight of hand that lets Simon also hold up a copy of remand on Simon's turn. Yeah. So do you know what does Simon need? What is the threshold when you resolve gift ungiven? I'm I'm trying to remember. It's it's somewhere in my brain to when you cast gifts ungiven with a baral in play, how many mana do you need? You need to have it- three mana on the back of it. Three so, mana. Exactly. Right. So if you have Baral in an extra land, you need two rituals, gets you up to five. Manamorphose gets you up to six. Gifts, you go down to three, and then you can get Past in Flames, two rituals, and a Manamorphose and go off from there. Right. As long as you can get Past in Flames and some rituals, you'll have plenty of mana once you get the Past in Flames off. And even if they bin it, it doesn't really stop your combo at all. Right, and it looks like consider Bend and Odawara, tough choice to legend rule, and he's rewarded with a Spire Bluff Canal and the Ritual off the top. I think this is going to be game. Yeah, so, I mean, quickly looking at it, I mean, each Ritual generates two mana, and the Mana Morphos generates one, so that's five mana. He gets to cast Gifts with two mana floating. Is that enough? Land drop, it's three. So you play the Spire Bluff, down to just Spire Bluff up after casting Baral, Desperate Rit, three mana. Desperate Rit, five mana. Manamorphos, right, six. six mana. The and land three. drop being the extra one is the key here. Awesome. And I'm sure Simon will figure this out. I mean, the only card he could really have to worry about is like Warping Whale. And I don't know if if it's something that's on his radar, but I'm sure if he's taking this long, he's probably thinking, okay, what can Corey do to stop me right now? Right. And this is the kind of spot where I don't think it's that unreasonable to just play Spire Bluff Canal, cast Baral and Past with Remand up? I mean, I mean, I guess that doesn't really be Warping Whale either. Doesn't but you... really accomplish too much because of the Warping Whale getting cast and then recast, though, is the only issue. Yeah, totally. But I guess on the other hand, you can assume Baumeister doesn't have Warping Whale because he didn't cast it last turn? Yeah. Well, I don't know. What do you have cast it last turn? I assume that in this deck you're trying to hit that four thresholds so hard that if you don't have Tron rolled up, maybe you just really want to get the one ring or Karn the Great Creator online? Yeah, I mean, the one upside of him having done, would have done that is, like, if he gets to cast Karn, he can get a Tormod's Crypt, which interrupts the combo. So, mm. yeah, that's a good call. 
he is unlikely to have warping oil in his range if Simon is being very careful to think about what else Corey could have had on the last turn. And there's possibly a degree where it's a super convoluted combo. Chess clocks are at play here. If you mess up one part, then that might be it. Yeah. And this is a little risky from Simon because if he were to top deck that Tron piece, he could actually cast Karn two times, which could be Whoa. a big problem. Well, I guess here Simon gets to Ritual plus Gifts, which just makes this extremely deterministic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from this spot, there's not a ton that I think he can mess up. I mean, he he really doesn't have an ability to interrupt the Gifts, and he de definitely got rewarded for this play if Corey were to have a copy of Warping Well. And honestly, there are a few things that are satisfying whenever you've been playing this long is just getting to resolve the gifts ungiven, right? It's the type of thing you're driving up to the tournament. You're dreaming of the weirdest gift piles you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing about Simon's deck is he also has four copies of Flames of Anor in his deck, which, I mean, doesn't really matter when you're going off with gifts, but that's a really innovative way of having some game against the traditional hate cards against you while also, as we've seen, being really good against Rakdos of Oak. So I yeah. really like that inclusion. Yeah, that card's really nice and kind of just does everything this deck does in terms of breaking up hate pieces, keeping you alive a bit, gassing you back up on resources, if that those things don't matter. And Baral and Electromancer both being wizards means that it's even working over time more consistently than you'd think. Totally. And it looks like most of what Simon's thinking about here is just land drops. I see him kind of thumbing a polluted delta out, Electromancer, Desperate Ritual, and thinking about what the fourth card needs to be. Yeah, I mean, if he just gets another ritual here, that probably would help. I, I can't imagine you can go wrong if you just pick two rituals in this pile. Because even if he gives you no rituals, you're going to have enough mana with the uh, with the Baral, plus the ritual in hand, and the Mana Morphos to stop him, I think. Or to go off through it, rather. Right, exactly. And getting this Goblin of Electromancer is just paying a ton of respect to the card Warping Whale, which we've been talking about before, but it can't actually hit a 2-2 and is much better against a 1-3. Yeah, good point. Getting the Goblin Electromancer is a really heads-up play by Simon. And here, I imagine Simon just knows he has the tools, just don't mess it up. You just want to make sure that you kind of do the level 1 thing play it all perfectly and execute. Getting the polluted Delta here is also so smart. Like it's just a ritual at this point in the game. It's the same card. <laughs> oh yeah. It's always so nice. It's like the, the old, uh, the strongest Moxon is your land drop. But now we have Electromancer, Desperate Ritual, Pyretic Ritual, and Polluted Delta, as you mentioned, being the four cards for Corey to look at. At the point that your opponent's just getting a bunch of mana with gifts ungiven, but was willing to blow a desperate ritual to cast it, you've got to be feeling pretty bad if you're Corey. Yeah, for sure. And on top of that, him casting a gifts ungiven and not getting pass in flames means there's almost assuredly another copy of gifts coming from Simon's hand. Right, exactly. Normally this is getting whatever you're missing, and if all you needed was the gifts ungiven in your hand to be another mana source, that's, that's pretty brutal. You just... It's not literally face up, but we know both of these players are accomplished enough to know what's going on and expect their opponent to be playing correctly. Does the one ring stop his combo completely from Simon's end? Like if the one ring were to come down, I wonder what Simon can do in order to beat it. I imagine take an extra turn to combo is most of what his plan is going to be from there. Maybe there's something you can set up where you have a bunch of remands or something, but I don't think Grape Shot can do anything through the One Ring, and I'm not seeing anything to really punish that. Right, and that being the case means there could be situations where on the Tron side you have a ton of mana and you can't actually kill them because you can go through the combo, but they have a One Ring active that they can play another copy of in the next turn. So I'm trying to see if that's a thing that might come up in a future game because that's not really a dynamic that we've seen before in this current modern Right, and the fact that the One Ring even turns off Gifts Ungiven is a lot, since you can't target your opponent to split the pile. Speaking of splitting the piles, though, we have Baral, then Pyretic Ritual, then Manamorphos for Mana. Gifts Ungiven looking like it's the next thing on the menu. 
So Simon did all of this, and he didn't even need to worry about Warping Wheel because he has the reman backup, I guess. Right. This is the spot where you almost wonder if he's inviting the Warping Whale just to turn Remand into draw two, discard one. At this point, I don't really think there's anything that's on Simon's radar. He's just like, okay, I got to go do my combo, cast a Grape Shot for 40 damage. <laughs> yep. And here's the usual suspects off the gifts I'm given. That's the Pyretic Ritual, another Desperate Ritual, another Manamorphose, and a Past in Flames. Just all the mana and the spells in the world. So when you were picking a deck for Modern Super League, what was your process in order to arrive on Living End? Uh, so generally, I thought that Corey would be doing something with artifacts. I wasn't sure if it would necessarily be the Just Guy Breach stuff he's been championing, but I know Tron is something that's also pretty popular, and I didn't think I could skill diff you or Simon, so I wanted to do something that was kind of just going over the top of what other people might bring, and I thought Living In was kind of close enough. Scam was also on the radar and something that I thought could be fine, but everybody would have a plan for that deck. So I didn't want to be the one bringing that one either. At the last second, I almost did the cool mono black deck that I've seen Nassif playing a lot, the sort of cofferless coffers. With but I chickened out. New card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, with Beseech the Mirror. That one's looked super cool. I know there's it plays really well with a lot of cards from the Lord of the Rings set. I, on the other hand, am the only player to show up with any new cards in my modern deck playing a new copy of Undying Evil, the the wicked with the wicked role. So I felt excited to to resort to my level one thinking of, okay, like <laughs> on two sides of the spectrum, there's well, scam's the best deck, you have to play scam. And then the other side being, okay, like if you play scam, I don't know what you're doing. Like everyone's gonna be prepared for you. Don't don't even think of playing scam. And I just decided I was going to to be the one guy that shows up and is like, okay, everyone's expecting scam, but maybe they're expecting some level two deck to beat that. I'll just go back to scam. So, I oh yeah, I thought it was a great choice in general. Like especially if you're going to any something like a pro tour where scam did well despite being on everyone's radar. You obviously and your team very successful at the most recent modern pro tour. Okay, so taking a look at the sideboards from each player after that game one, we see... So one thing that's interesting about Tron is it actually has a decent amount of sideboard cards. This might not be obvious on first glance, but the deck's ability to need some number of Karn the Great Creator targets is not that high. Like, if you have one bullet that you can get that's consistently good, that's good enough. And then there's also a ton of small up upgrades you can make to the deck to help it improve. So... You see Corey has the Worm Coil Engines just to have an additional beater where the Oblivion Stones are bad. And Corey has, you know, some dismembers that he had game one, two to answer the Goblin Electromancers. What does Simon have on his side? And it looks like Simon is actually just not really changing his game plan very much. We see some copies of Blood Moon making their way into the deck. Obviously a hammer against something like versus mine, versus tower, etc. Just shaving some copies of Flames of Anor and that Spike Field Hazard, I believe, is the other card that made it to the sideboard. But for the most part, he's the aggro deck that's just trying to execute his game plan in this matchup and doesn't want to mess with the formula too much. So if you were to resolve the Stone Brain, do you just go straight for Grape Shot or do you do something else if is able to get that target off it's kind of interesting to me if there's like something else you'd resort to honestly i think that's pretty interesting to think about i almost wonder if simon's supposed to be bringing in one copy of empty the warrens or if his whole plan is just all right well i'm gonna stop Corey from doing anything on turn three untap and kill him that's sort of what i was thinking like maybe you want the one copy of empty because it also helps in those games where you want to cast the empty and leave up remand for something like the one ring if they get their mana developed mm. yeah that's super interesting that's a good way to actually still feel like you can do something while your opponent's shields down from the one ring all right good opening hand on simon's side electromancer some cantrips or remand Corey cannot throw his hand back fast enough but this is a good one. This is exactly what you'd hope for from the Tron side. You have turn three Tron. You have the One Ring, which we talked about a lot. And then 
he has plenty of redundant ways of finding some sort of payoff, whether that's, yeah, the ancient stirrings or the scrying which he put back. Right, this is the kind of hand that you're hoping for whenever you register a Tron deck. Ooh, and, and a big draw from Simon. That Blood Moon is really going to be scary if he gets to turn three. Yeah, that's going to be so huge. One of the things that this Storm deck is so great at that Simon has brought is even his eight ways to crank out Blood Moon on turn two. That's cool. Yeah, you can just Pyretic Ritual Blood Moon. Yeah, this but, is just one of the decks that can do that in Modern. But the interesting thing is Simon can't really cast Blood Moon with his current mana. This Ottawara doesn't really work well with Blood Moon. And if he locks himself out, that's going to give a ton of time for Corey to develop with the One Ring or something else. Yeah, that would be so brutal. And he's found a couple of Metamorphoses to maybe address a little bit of that, but he still doesn't have a third land, doesn't have Rituals. Gonna need some help here. So we're probably going to see a remand on this one ring coming down next turn, more than likely. From that spot, though, if Simon can find a basic, like a basic island, maybe he just decides, I'm going to play Blood Moon because I don't have another option. Oh, wow. And, and that's huge. The Chalice of the Void really helps in this spot because now it means that he might be able to shut off all the ones or the twos, depending on what he decides to do. Yeah, this is super interesting. Before, I thought there was a lot of merit to maybe just getting pressure on the table with Worm Coil Engine, but now you really just want to get this one ring out there. And like we've been talking about, if a one ring hits the battlefield, you know you're safe for another turn. Right, exactly. And that's minimum. And with all the cards like Oblivion Stone or even some of the stuff like Tormod's Crypt, it can be hard once Baumeister starts untapping with all of that mana. And one interesting dynamic here is do you save the Chalice to hit it on two where you know it'll stop the combo? Or do you play it out right now just to make sure that you get to hit something? And he decides, all right, Chalice needs to stop the combo. I can't go for anything with it right now. Next turn, I'll have eight mana so that I can play one ring and Chalice on two. Yeah, and I really like this patience from Corey. I, one mana is going to hurt your own Ancient Stirrings. If this Worm Coil gets checked, maybe you run into some problems. And it's so much better to just have that sort of safety blanket of a strong Chalice in the Void against a deck like this. The beauty of the Tron deck is, in its current form, it can operate pretty well under Blood Moon. So it's not like it's lights out. Like, if a Blood Moon hits the battlefield, and then Corey decides to go for the Chalice or even the One Ring and start drawing cards... He's still in the game. Like, it's not like this game is over because a Blood Moon gets played against Tron anymore. And you're completely correct about that. The fact that tapping out for Blood Moon would be met with a Chalice on two could even be lights out for Simon. At least Simon has this Flames of Ignore. So worst case, he can take a turn off, kill the Chalice, and go from there. But that's really going to slow him down. Oh, and look at this. After just cantripping a bunch, Goblin Electromancer gets developed. One ring Corey from is a Corey. really strong turn here, right? This is super strong from Corey's side. This is pretty nice. Hopefully this Flames of Anor isn't too brutal. Well, Flames gets to draw two and kill Chalice because of that old wizard text on Goblin Electromancer, which mm -hmm. is awesome. And then from there, is there anything else he could do? Ooh, and, and the Desperate Ritual is a good draw, but the colored sources might make it hard to do anything with it this turn. Right, it's particularly awkward as well that the One Ring has turned off Gifts Ungiven. So even if there's a world in which Simon is able to top deck Rituals, try and go for the combo, he still can't. He can't cast Gifts Ungiven. Grape Shot has complete protection from it right now. So we get to kill the Chalice and draw two. If we see Simon hit a land drop here, maybe he ends up going Ritual. Okay, maybe he can Metamorphose into ritual into blood moon i mean he can certainly cast the blood moon this turn if he chooses yeah I, I actually really like this blood moon once you've hit the fourth metamorphose it looks like there's a past in flames in hand as well so you're really just checking cory to have a card the great creator right yeah for sure i mean right now cory's hand doesn't really do anything versus a blood moon like it really slows him down again the One Ring is going to do its thing, draw a lot of cards, and that means that the game will definitely go on from here. Like, we could see another One Ring hit the battlefield. We could see a Besaju from Corey's side, which would be really good at helping him develop still. But I think Simon's going to go for this Blood Moon. 
Oh, wait, can he actually just kill from here? So Desperate Ritual, Metamorphose, and then cast the front of Past and Flames to get back all of these rituals from the graveyard? So I guess he can't can literally off, kill but him. But he can't kill, it's like the same right. issue. Maybe we see a lot of setup right here. Like, maybe he can just cast a ton of rituals, puts a goblin, a barrel in play, but this is where having the one empty in your deck is probably really good. Yeah, this is... This is such an interesting spot. I really do think if you have the empty in your deck here, I don't. I think I think you can't lose because you can certainly find it with the amount of looks you have, and then you can cast empty and probably leave up some number of remands with a blood moon in play. You have enough mana to probably do it all. Maybe you can't cast gifts ungiven through the one ring. That's true. So consider is really the only looking that. I think Simon can do. Well, he has I four guess there's a bunch of metamorphos. You're, cor you're correct. You're correct. And Flames of Anor, which can draw two, and Preordains. So you could probably look at like half your deck. Sure, sure. But that might not be enough, honestly. Like, it's a good question of like, what do you do after all of this resolves? Yeah, how likely is the world that the best thing you can do here is just empty for a bunch and cast Blood Moon and cross your fingers? In Simon's current spot, maybe the best thing that he could hope for is like putting a Baral to go with this Electromancer in play and then leaving up Remand and going from there and putting a Blood Moon in play. Like if you can do all of that, I guess it's hard to leave up Remand because you're not going to have any untapped lands, so you can't really do that either. Yeah, at this point, I think this consider that Simon's casting is just digging for a blue source. Oh, found the Remand. That's awkward. Has Simon played a land this turn? No, I don't believe that he has. Last turn, he cast the Electromancer and a Cantrip. So, I mean, he could go for the Past and Flames line. Now, he plays Baral or Electromancer, whatever one you, you choose. And then you go for Past and Flames, cast a ton of Rituals, and then you can hit a Land Drop and play Blood Moon plus leave up Remand. That seems really strong still. Yeah, at this point, it's just a matter of finding another blue source that stays blue under a blood moon seeing a lot of past and flame stuff but it's unclear if Simon can actually kill if he spends too much of his graveyard great point if you use all your metamorphoses what do you have left right that's always the tough thing is you can do a bunch of fancy arm waving but you need it to convert to damage at some point there's no way that he could, like, oh. kill... Oh, the island. That's huge. Oh, okay. Actually, it looks like Simon has mana for Blood Moon and can now cast Remand? Okay, we have another mana Morphos from Yard. Yeah. I, I think I like the idea of just playing Blood Moon and then casting... Uh, if you can play Blood Moon, Goblin, Electromancer, and leave up Remand, that would be a pretty perfect end to the turn. Mm-hmm. Completely. It's possible the line at this point is he's just casting as many cantrips as he can without actually using that many rituals and trying to balance that against what he needs to set up next turn. I mean, at this point, the good thing about past and planes is it's still in the graveyard. So if we get to another turn where you have three of the cost reducers in play, you don't really need to find anything else as long as you don't turn through the rest of your graveyard. Totally, yeah. It's all about just making sure you leave yourself enough raw material to reduce Corey's life total to zero. Not a ton else that Corey can do, though. I mean, Corey really wants to find Warping Whale. If he can find Warping Whale, then he can interact with the Past and Flames, potentially. Oh, but it's even shut off by Blood Moon. I, I didn't even think about that for a second. Like, Blood Moon stops Warping Whale from being cast. Oh, right, right, right. I feel like right now Simon's sort of in his happy place. He's just clicking a ton of buttons, <laughs> building his hand as wide as possible, and passing the turn remand up. Pretty comfy spot. Who is the one who takes the game actions? All right, All right well, there's this tower off the top. The one ring about to do a lot of heavy lifting. 
those ones are, are not going to cut it right now. No, I don't think Corey was looking for Ursus Tower number three or Worm Coil Engine number two. At this point, he's in the real, I sure hope I can somehow survive phase. What can we talk about ancient stirrings for here that might help? You can ancient stirrings for, my first thought was Viseju, but now he doesn't have another green source. So that doesn't do a ton. Maybe he Wait. has uh, a relic in his deck. I, I don't think I saw any though. So I'm not sure that there's any way of him stopping the combo for next turn. Yeah, and looking over the deck list right now, I'm not seeing a relic. Obviously, there's the Tormod's Crypt, but I suspect that's in the sideboard still. Okay, Besage you with Chromatic Star. There's yeah, not so much can, mana on the back. We can Besage you the Blood Moon, but the Prophets doesn't really accomplish much. Like, sure, you killed the Blood Moon, but you're still facing lethal on the next turn, and there's a remand. So I don't see a ton of ways for for Corey to get out of this. I mean, this is sort of the weakness of the Tron deck in general. It's not that great against spell-based combo decks where you want to have ways of interacting with their plans, but a lot of the ways of doing so are very costly. Like, currently, you have to resolve a Karn or draw one of his cards like Chalice that he already used, so it's tough. All right, when we see Simon untapping with the world in his fingers, it feels like. At this point, it's a, just trying to imagine how many layers of imaginary hate you can beat in an open deck list event like this. I think Simon knows there's nothing coming. There's at most Besage you. I guess you could Warping Whale after that, but I don't think that matters. Yeah, and I think Simon's probably just trying to figure out what's the easiest way to do this that can't be interacted with because he could certainly go twice or three times through his combo with this many cost reducers in play. It's not really a, there's not really a clear bottleneck here. Usually you're looking for either a bottleneck of mana of resources or of some sort of pressure. But right now, worst case scenario, let's say that Corey gets another turn. What happens on the next turn? That's going to be super scary for, for Simon. I mean, I think that Simon's just going to look towards, Okay, let me try to kill through one piece of interaction. Let's say he can Warping Whale. As long as I leave a Remandism comboing, it won't be an issue. Yeah, and you can see him now going ahead and clicking the Grape Shot on the first Gifts Ungiven. Not a good sign for the opponent of the Gifts Ungiven. We could probably cast Grape Shot three, maybe four times this turn if we had to. Right, there's even some of the old school tricks with it where you end up remanding your own Grape Shots. Yeah, he got a ton of damage that way. I appreciate the flicking at the desk. I do that all day. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I was sort of surprised by is I didn't expect Corey to bring Tron at all. Yeah? Why? I honestly thought that he was likely to play something like Breach or some other deck with artifacts like you mentioned. But it makes more sense thinking about it. I mean, he certainly has a wide range. He's a very good player. But I uh, I, I was excited because I came up with the idea of playing Wear Tear in my scam sideboard in my Rakdos Evoke deck. And I was like, okay, if I can splash for three Wear Tears, it'll be good against what I expect Simon to bring. I thought Simon was going to bring something like Amulet or Hammer Time, where I've seen him like those decks in the past. And as a teammate, I know he likes those sort of strategies a lot. So I figured he might bring those two decks. And then I thought Corey will bring Breach. Therefore, well, Wear and Tear seems really good. I, I had no idea what you might bring. So that was a total surprise to me. Yeah, I had some idea. Uh, I at least thought Corey would be on an Urza Saga deck, which is why I went with Foundation Breaker over Ingot Chewer. And I think I got a little punished for that one. Where does Ingot Chewer uh, shine in particular? Uh I mean, the whole thing is just that Ingot Chewer costs one less mana, but hits half as much stuff. So if they don't have Leyline of the Void, if they don't have Rest in Peace, if they don't have Urza Saga, then it really doesn't matter. But I wanted to at least be somewhat respectful of Urza Saga possibilities, which obviously you were talking about, it, or at least alluding to with Wear Tear. 
And it looks like this Past in Flames is going to come really close to locking this one up. So you'll be the one playing against Simon here soon. How many times have you and Simon played? Simon and I have played a lot in play testing, but outside of play testing. <laughs> okay. In tournaments, we played two times at the Pro Tour Mom. So two Pro Tours ago. And uh I think before that, Simon and I played. I think those were the only two times Simon and I have played in a tournament. So are you two oh or one one then? So I beat Simon in draft and I lost to him in constructed. So one and one. Okay. I like that you didn't ask if I was 0 and 2 against him. I appreciate that. Oh, you would have mentioned it. You would have led with that. Fair. Good read. <laughs> Although I might not have brought it up at all. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. 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 Listen, it's really hard whenever someone, at least for me, whenever someone asks me, hey, how many times have you played against person that I have only lost to? For me to not just be like, well, you know, I have lost to Brad Nelson every time we've played or whatever. Well, hopefully you haven't lost to Brad Nelson's brother that many times. No, I've actually have a really good record against that half of the family. Great. That'll be very super funny, for you. very polar, hoping it carries here in a minute as we <laughs> see another gifts ungiven from Simon Nielsen, just getting more damage spells, just trying to trying to go ahead and put a pin in this one. At this point, Simon could probably cast three or four grape shots, and this one's going to be all over. He's just going through the motions and making sure that he can close out the game without any sort of thing interrupting. But I trust in Simon that he'll figure out a way to get the job done here. Oh, yeah, I'd hope so. At this point, it would take some real meteor strike type of situations for Simon to not walk away with a dub here. What I really love about this modern Super League is the fact that every single week we get to both play and commentate and watch some really great players like while they're going through their thought process. And for me, I'm mostly on the other side facing against Simon, but watching him and trying to figure out what is he thinking right now, like what sort of edge case scenarios is he playing around is really fun because Simon's the sort of player that's not going to leave any sort of chance and give the opponent anything that can possibly get them out. If he can create a scenario in his mind, he will make sure to not allow something disastrous to happen. I really respect that he's super good at that. Oh, yeah. He's just always a great player and getting the chance to cover players that are this strong and play at this sort of level so consistently just actually ends up providing, you know, anecdotally has provided me a ton of level up moments where I was watching someone else play. Oh, why did they do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. And then 10 minutes later can figure out why they played this thing and won a game that I never would have.